Hello, I'm Keith Frankish. Welcome to the third lecture in this course on the illusionist view of consciousness. This lecture is called The Case for Illusionism. Just to remind you of the plan of the lectures, in the first lecture we looked at uh, the problem of phenomenal consciousness. The problem arises because it seems that consciousness involves direct awareness of mental qualities distinct from the qualities of things we're aware of in the world. This seems to present a hard problem and I explained that the illusionist response to it is to deny that picture of consciousness, to deny that consciousness does involve direct awareness of mental qualities, qualia, phenomenal properties, what it is, likenesses, the various labels are used. In the second lecture, we started to build the case for this illusionist view by looking at arguments against the alternative realist view, the view that consciousness does involve awareness of, of qualia. And we looked at a variety of arguments um, presented by Daniel Dennett. In this lecture, we're going to continue to build the case for illusionism by looking at some positive arguments for the view to supplement the, the arguments against the alternative. OK, so let me begin with a few preliminaries. Uh, here is a, 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 a photograph of a typical illusionist. Illusionists, you see, are maniac scientists. Um, or at least that's how I think many people imagine illusionists. They, they think that illusionists are, are motivated by a crude, scientific view of the world. A view that uh, if, if science can't explain it, then we should just deny its existence. Or they think that illusionists are committed to, dogmatically committed to a physicalist view of the, of, of the world. And that anything that doesn't fit into that picture again has to be uh, denied. Even if it's... Uh, the most obvious thing in the world, as many people would say, phenomenal consciousness is. Now, speaking for myself, I, I, I don't see it that way. I, I don't endorse a, a narrow, scientific attitude. Um, there are many ways of understanding the world besides those provided by, by um, science. And I'm not dogmatically committed to physicalism. I do think physicalism is a good working hypothesis, but I'm not dogmatically committed to its being true, and if there are good reasons for rejecting it, I'd be perfectly willing to do so. I'm not motivated in that way. I'm motivated simply by a desire to find the best explanation of consciousness, and I think that illusionism is the best explanation, or at least points in the direction of the best explanation. Similarly, I, I'm not claiming that illusionism must be true. Um, other views, I'm not, I can't, I'm not ruling out other views a priori. And I, they, they might well be true. I'm, in fact, all I really want to insist on here is that illusionism might be true, that I'm asking you not to rule it out. Uh, I think it's a, a coherent view, an important view, and one worth taking seriously. I, I, I also happen to think it's, it's the best, but... I'm content if I can just persuade you to take it seriously. Nor am I claiming to have a knockdown argument for illusionism. I, I'm not going to present a, a series of premises uh, that, that, that logically entail the truth of, of uh, illusionism. Uh, or even if I did present an argument in that form, I wouldn't claim to be certain of the premises. Um, uh, what I'm claiming is that illusionism is on balance the most plausible theory available. And the, the case for it depends on pulling together lots of different considerations, none of which in itself is conclusive, but put them all together. And I think this, I think illusionism offers the best, um, the best explanation, the most plausible theory. Also, I'm not denying that science may have to expand radically in order to explain uh, the world. I described illusionism as a conservative theory in the sense that it it claims that consciousness can be understood within a current scientific framework or within modest expansions of it, that we don't need something like a scientific revolution to understand consciousness. Now, that doesn't mean that I, I'm ruling out scientific revolutions at all. We may very well need scientific revolutions. My claim is just that we don't need them to explain consciousness. This isn't to say that consciousness is easy to explain. It's not. It's going to be very complicated. But I think 
it won't require us to radically rethink the nature of reality. OK, so let's look at some arguments for illusionism, some considerations that tend to support the position. Let's begin with a, with a simple one, anomalousness. If you come across some phenomenon that seems strange, mysterious, scientifically in inexplicable, then it's reasonable to suspect that it might be an illusion. If someone uh, appears to levitate from the, ground, uh, from the ground before your eyes, then it's reasonable to suspect that there's a trick involved. Uh, resistance to scientific explanation is prima facie evidence for illusion. It doesn't show that the thing is, isn't real, but it's reason to suspect that it might be an illusion. And so, uh, from this perspective, the, the strangeness of phenomenal properties, the existence of the hard problem itself, is a reason to at least consider the possibility that there's some kind of illusion or misrepresentation or misconception or misinterpretation going off. That things aren't quite as they seem. Uh, and I, I have here a, a picture and a quotation from James Randi. James Randi, who sadly died recently, the famous magician and uh, illusionist in the, in the theatrical sense, uh, and also a great debunker of uh, claims uh, for paranormal uh, powers, uh, debunker of, of, of people who claim to have paranormal powers. And uh, Randy said this to uh, Yuri Geller, Yuri Geller, the, um, uh, the, uh, the man who, who claimed to have, uh, who claims to have um, the power to, to bend, claims to be able to bend spoons simply by, meant by the power of his mind, simply by concentrating on, on the spoon in his hand, he can make it bend. Now, uh, Randy uh, knew various ways of, of making it appear that you are bending spoons in that way without applying any force to them. And he said this to, to Geller, if he's doing it by divine means, by, by, some, by using some kind of supernatural powers, then I can only tell him this, Mr. Geller, you're doing it the hard way. There are much easier ways to create the impression that you're at your, um, at your bending spoons uh, without applying any force to them. And I, I like to say the, the same thing about uh, phenomenal consciousness. We have this sense that we have, the, that we have a, uh, a, a, a private inner world that is magical and uh, resistant to physical explanation. We have that sense. And somehow nature has created that sense in us. But if nature did it by actually creating such an internal world, then nature was doing it the hard way. Maybe there are easier ways, I believe there are easy ways of, easier ways of creating that sense, making us believe that we have such an, a, a magical inner world. So, and I, the, this kind of consideration, the consideration from anomalousness, I think has special force if the phenomenon we're talking about is viewpoint dependent. I suppose you see someone apparently levitate from the ground, but they insist that to witness the performance you must stand in a particular location and you mustn't move. Well, that's a reason to suspect illusion. If you were to move, you might see how they were doing the trick. And Phenomenal consciousness is viewpoint dependent, uh, in a way. It, it's only apparent from the first person perspective, from the perspective of introspection. Uh, neuroscientists investigating your brain don't don't observe it. Well, this is a point that's, that that's standardly made in discussions of phenomenal consciousness. It's subjective, but that itself can be seen as a reason to suspect that it might be illusory, because it's only visible from one perspective. Uh, here, uh, the psychologist Nicholas Humphrey has, a, has an example that I particularly like. Uh, the, the Penrose Triangle, the, uh, that is uh, this uh, figure here, this, this impossible um, object that is uh, impossible to construct in three-dimensional space. 
So that's an analogy, if you like, for, for phenomenal consciousness, something that seems uh, impossible within our uh, physicalist framework. Uh, and Humphrey compares that with another uh, 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 object, this one, which he calls the Gregundrum, after Richard Gregory, who uh, created the Penrose Triangle, is named after Roger Penrose, who I, I think um, uh, first described it. The Gregundrum is named after Richard Greg the psychologist Richard Gregory, who, who designed it. Uh, that is a perfectly possible construction. You, you can make one of these out of bits of wood, and it looks something like that. Now, for most angles, this just looks like a strange construction of three pieces of wood, but if you look at it from exactly the right angle, it looks just like a Penrose triangle. From precisely the right angle, it looks like something impossible. So here you can create the illusion of, of, of an impossible triangle if you look at a Gregundrum from exactly the right angle. Now, um, and Humphrey suggests that uh, phenomenal consciousness might be a bit like that. Maybe certain brain states create the illusion of phenomenality when they're viewed from the perspective of introspection, when they're viewed introspectively. Um, they're no more impossible than the Gregundrum, but seen from the perspective of introspection, uh, they uh, create the illusion of something impossible. Now, none of that is conclusive, of course, but it is suggestive. Uh, it suggests that an illusionist perspective on consciousness might be worth exploring. Okay, so here is another uh, another point, another consideration, coherence. There's reason to suspect that realism about phenomenal properties isn't coherent. And uh, therefore the delusionism wins by default. This is really just a recasting of the points from the previous lecture, so I will be very brief here. Again, we have uh, Daniel Dennett here, and we remember from the last lecture that Dennett has a variety of uh, arguments and intuition pumps designed to cast doubt on the idea that we can know our own qualia uh, as qualia are standardly conceived of. There's no way for either first-person introspection or third-person science to answer certain questions about the nature of our qualia, even very basic questions such as, have my qualia completely inverted? Now, if that's right, then if, if there's no way to answer these questions, then that suggests that the concept of qualia itself is, is ill-defined and impossible to apply. And therefore, that phenomenal consciousness, which consists in the uh, uh, existence of qualia, is not a well-defined target for explanation. And if that's right, then solving the hard, trying to solve the hard problem is, is, is just not a coherent project. And so that means that the only coherent project that's left to us is that of explaining our phenomenal judgments and our reports and so on and other reactions. Um, we're disposed to say these things, but the things we say don't really amount to a coherent description of something that could be real. So all that's left to explain is why we're disposed to say those things and think those things. Okay, well, let's look at another consideration now, another argument. Uh, this one I've called theoretical economy. Uh, the idea here is that illusionism offers a, a simpler, more elegant, more economical account of consciousness than its rivals. Uh, simpler than, than realist alternatives. The central question about phenomenal consciousness is how does phenomenality, these mental qualities, uh, how, does, how do these fit into uh, the scientific picture of the world? This is the hard problem. And so I'll, I'll say a little bit about, about that picture. Um, this is very simplified and schematic, and uh, it skates over an awful lot of, uh, of complications, but it will do to make the point. So science is painting a layered picture of the natural world, something like this. We start with, we can start with high-level, uh, complex high-level um, phenomena, such as social phenomena, and the activities of groups of people, large groups of people, and how they interact and so on. And then 
we can step down a level to uh, psychological phenomena, mental states and processes, then down to neural processes, processes in brains, to cellular processes inside, within individual cells, chemical processes, uh, chemical reactions and so on, and finally basic physical processes, processes involving atoms and their subatomic components and, and so on, right down to the, to the very basic entities posited by uh, modern physics. And it's a working hypothesis, at least, that processes at each of these levels, phenomena at each of these levels, can be reductively explained in terms of mechanisms at a lower level. The idea is that phenomena at each, at each level can be characterized in functional terms, in terms of operations or tasks that are being carried out. And then we look down to a lower level to identify the mechanisms that, ca that perform those functions, that carry out those functions, that implement them, that realize them. So you remember the definition of the, telev the discussion of the television from uh, lecture one. We saw how the, the, the task that a television performs is that of converting an incoming radio signal into a, into a moving picture. And we saw how, um, we, the, by looking at the mechanisms inside the television, we saw how this task was performed. We understood how it was, um, how it was done. And we reductively explained that, um, that function in terms of mechanisms at a, at, at a lower level. And so the general idea here is then that, that each of these levels can be reductively explained in terms of um, uh, that processes at each of these levels can be reductively explained in terms of more basic processes uh, at a level below. So social um, phenomena can be reductively explained in, in psychological terms, in terms of the beliefs and desires and other mental states of the individuals who compose, compose the society. Psychological phenomena can be, un, can be reductively explained in terms of uh, uh, processes within the brain, the coordinative activity of masses of, of neurons uh, communicating with each other and signaling to each other and so on, uh, that these uh, uh, neural processes can be explained in terms of processes within individual, uh, within individual neurons, individual brain cells, um, uh, 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 the way that um, uh, uh, neurotransmitters work, say, and the, 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 um, uh, the way that ne individual neurons fire and so on that these processes in turn can be explained in terms of the chemical reactions that are occurring, the, uh, the uh, molecules binding to uh, receptor sites and chemical reactions within cells and so on, and that all this in turn can be explained, that those chemical processes can be explained uh, in turn in terms of basic uh, physical processes at an atomic and subatomic level. So get this nice picture that everything can be reductively explained in terms of, of processes at a, at a more basic level, right down to the bottom. So the lower levels, and then we can think of this as kind of building up the other way, that the lower levels realize the processes at the higher level. So basic physical processes realize chemical ones, they, they implement, they make them um, real. Uh, uh, chemical processes implement Cellular ones, cellular ones implement neural ones, neural ones, psychological ones, psychological ones, social ones. I should stress here that this uh, division into into layers is uh, somewhat arbitrary, and there are many different ways of carving this up, and there are many different there are many complications that need to be added in here. Uh, issues about um, uh, uh, interaction between levels, and it's it, the, 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 this is a very simplified version of the picture, but it's enough to to get the um, the 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 the, um, the sense of the shape of the problem for um, um, uh, phenomenal consciousness, and it's a, a further uh, uh, assumption of this of this picture that the basic physical level is is fundamental. That's not realised in anything else. That's uh, that's just a it's just a brute fact about the world. But that's how it how it um, uh, how it is at the basic physical level. Uh, that level is also taken to be. Uh, uh, relatively uh, simple in the sense that uh, there are a relatively small number of fundamental entities and forces. Um, so all the rich complexity at the higher level can be explained in terms of a relatively simple ontology at the very basic level. And it's also, uh, basic physics is also widely assumed to be complete in the sense that we don't need to appeal to anything outside basic physics in order to explain uh, what happens there. Um, 
the activity of, of the basic physical components can be completely explained in terms of uh, the previous state of the basic physical system and basic physical um, laws. Um, so the picture that we get here is that everything is ultimately realized in basic physical states and can in principle be explained in, in terms of them. In principle, not in practice, we need all these higher level sciences to pick out patterns and um, that, are, that, 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 are, that are of importance to us in order to help us see um, patterns and generalizations that and explanations that wouldn't be visible uh, just by looking at the at, by looking at the basic physics, but still, there's nothing more going on than the basic physics. Everything at the higher levels is constituted by basic physical entities, uh, and it unfolds in accordance with with uh, basic physical laws. Uh, so we could say, in a sense, that everything is physical. It's it's there's nothing more to the world than the basic physical entities and. Uh, uh, operating in accordance with basic physical laws. Everything else uh, is a consequence of those, if you like. Everything is constituted by those. Um, as Saul Kripke, uh, uh, to, to borrow an image from Saul Kripke, once God had fixed the basic physical facts, he'd fixed all the facts on this view. So if God were to create a, a, a duplicate world, to this one and we're simply to reproduce all the basic physical facts of this world or but arrange for all the basic physical entities to be in exactly the same position and set up all the same basic physical laws if he duplicated that all the basic physical facts then he would have duplicated everything all the rest all the the higher levels of chemical cellular neural so, social psycho, uh, psychological social and so on would all come along for free as it were because ultimately it's nothing more than those uh, those things uh, uh, operating in accordance with the with the with the basic physical laws. Okay, so that's as a, again I want to stress that that's a very simplified picture, but it's 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 sufficiently um, sufficiently accurate to, to 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 get us to 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 um, uh, understand the problem of fitting phenomenality into this into this picture. The problem, of course, is that phenomenality doesn't seem to be reductively explicable in these ways. It, it, it seems that phenomenal properties can't be characterized in functional terms in terms of what they do. They're just pure feel. Uh, and we, we, can't, uh, we can't capture them, cap capture their nature in terms of certain tasks that they perform, so, uh, uh, certain operations that are being performed which we could then explain by identifying the mechanisms that perform them. Now, they're just a pure feel. So how do we explain, how do we explain those? How do we fit those into this picture um, where everything uh, can be reductively explained? Uh, so here's, here's one way of, of trying to do that. We could think of them as, if, if you like, external to the picture, uh, external add-ons to the picture. Um, so the idea is that that they are that phenomenal features are extra features of the world in addition to those that are mapped in this uh, uh, this picture of the physical world, um, but they are correlated with features of the physical world, so with features with with, with uh, features of the brain in a lawful way. Um, so the idea is this: that um, let's say we assume that that, that phenomenal properties. Uh, correlate with certain brain states. When you're in a certain brain state, the state that that's, um, occurs when you see something um, uh, blue, then you uh, uh, have a, uh, um, a blue uh, quality. You're acquainted with phenomenal blueness. And it's that's not reductively explicable. Everything about your brain, the fact that the complex state that your brain is in at that moment uh, the, the state of perceiving something uh, blue in in the world, that all that can be reductively explained in 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 terms of uh, uh, cellular processes and uh, chemical processes and so on. But this having this experience of phenomenal blueness that can't. That's just it's just a brute fact that when your brain is in that highly complex physical state, all of which can be reductively can be reductively explained, you have this 
uh, this particular quality, this particular phenomenal property, uh, phenomenal blueness. And that's just a fundamental law of nature. It can't be further explained. It just happens that way. And then it, again, of course, there's a similar fundamental law when you're in the state that uh, uh, when your when your brain is in the state of of um, um, perceiving something uh, yellow, then you're acquainted with phenomenal yellowness. And uh, when it's in the state of perceiving something uh, red, you're in the state of perceiving something. You, uh, you when your brain is in the state of perceiving something red you have uh, uh, an experience of phenomenal redness, and so on. Phenomenal green, purple, um, brown, and so on. For every every uh, colour you might experience, every shade of every colour, every degree of intensity of every, of, of every shade, and so on. And all of these are fundamental laws which can't be further explained. And so, so we're going to have... Um, an awful lot of these these laws. Similarly, for for other sense modalities, for uh, hearing a certain musical uh, uh, um, note, again, when your brain's when your auditory system is in a certain state, then you have a certain auditory phenomenal experience. And again, it's just a fundamental law that this that this phenomenal state accompanies that brain state. Again, for other uh, for every musical uh, for every sound you can you can you can uh, distinguish. And then again for things like textures, feeling textures, and so on and so on. Again, for every possible experience you might have, there's a fundamental law linking it to the corresponding brain state. And none of these laws can be reductively explained. Maybe there might be a way of introducing some sort of uh, um, uh, uh, system, system, systematicity to these laws. Maybe some of them could be uh, expressed more, slightly more economically, but none of them can be reductively explained. They're all fundamental laws, and so there are going to be millions upon millions of these fundamental laws linking specific complex brain states with specific, specific highly complex brain states with specific simple phenomenal properties. So it's a, what, what is being linked here by these fundamental laws is a very, very complex brain state involving activity among billions of neurons and a very simple phenomenal property, the property of seeing phenomenal blueness of some shade or whatever. And... Uh, Herbert Feigl coined this term nomological danglers for these things. Danglers because they sort of hang from, they sort of dangle from the physical picture. They're not integrated with it. They just hang from it um, uh, as external add-ons. And nomological because they're uh, related uh, to the physical world in a law-like nomological way. Okay. So, I mean, that's one picture you could have. But I, I think it's a very, I don't think it's very, economical, a very um, uh, elegant picture. And this was expressed by the um, uh, Anglo-Australian philosopher J.J.C. Smart um, in a famous paper, um, uh, Sensations and Brain Processes. And he said this, I cannot believe that ultimate laws of nature, fundamental laws, could relate simple constituents, the phenomenal properties, to configurations consisting of perhaps billions of neurons, and goodness knows how many billion billions of ultimate particles that compose the billions of neurons and then billions of basic physical particles that um, compose uh, the, the brain. Such ultimate laws would be like nothing so far known in science. They have a queer smell to them. I'm just unable to believe in the nomological danglers themselves or in the laws by which they would dangle. Um, so I, again, that doesn't show that the view is, is, uh, is uh, impossible, or, uh, but it does show that it's a, kind of, it's a kind of theoretically costly one. Uh, another option for the phenomenal realist is, and one that's become... Um, Oh, let me, sorry, before I go into that, let, let me mention another uh, problem here. Um, the problem of causal closure, it's, it's an extension of the problem we've just been discussing. Um, okay, so it seems obvious that phenomenal properties, if they were real, would, would have effects on us. If being in pain, if what it is to be in pain is to be acquainted with pain qualia, then it seems pain qualia must, must have an effect on us. I mean, pain has an effect on us, and if that's what, and if, Pain consists in uh, having pain qualia, then pain qualia must have an effect on us. But it's really hard to uh, to justify that uh, intuition if we have this picture of um, phenomenal properties as 
add-ons to the to, to the physical um, to the physical to, uh, to the physical world, because it seems that it looks as if all changes in the physical world can be fully explained in terms of prior states of the physical world. Um, this just follows from the idea that everything is realized in the basic physical uh, um, uh, states and that basic physics is complete and closed, nothing into, nothing, um, uh, no, there's no outside influences on it. Um, and so we, uh, the, the phrase that's used here is to say that the physical world is closed under causation. Uh, nothing from outside the physical world, the world that's, that's realized in basic physics, uh, intervenes to affect what happens within the physical world. Now you might think, well, what about quantum events? They're, 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 they're inherently unpredictable. Well, that's true, but even they have their probabilities fixed by prior physical states. We may not know which way, which way the, the, um, uh, some quantum event is going to, to turn out, but the probabilities of it turning out one way or another are completely fixed by the preceding states of the physical system. So even there, there's no room for uh, there to be any kind of meaningful intervention from outside. Uh, to 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 make things come out in a way that that um, that de defied those probabilities. So it seems this is a problem for phenomenal realists. They want to say that uh, it, at least if they like, if they take the add-on view that phenomenal properties are uh, are not part of the the, um, uh, the 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 physical world itself. How are they going? How are they going to reconcile these these two claims that phenomenal properties? That the feel of, of pain, say, has a causal effect, and the idea that the physical world is, is closed under causation. Uh, one option would be to say, well, maybe uh, uh, some events uh, have more than one cause. So they, they have this a complete physical cause. Let's say the, the events in the brain that we um, uh, that produce the pain reactions. Okay, so when I, I'm in pain, I have uh, things happen in my brain, and they cause all the pain reactions. The, 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 uh, the crying out and rubbing the affected area and, uh, and physiological reactions, sweating and so on, stress levels and all this. So now they're caused um, by events in the brain. They have a, prior, a complete um, explanation in terms of physical processes in the brain. But uh, maybe they, they also have a cause. They also have a phenomenal cause. So they have two sets of causes, each of which perhaps will be sufficient to, to uh, uh, on its own, so it's like somebody being, um, okay, somebody's death being uh, due to two things at the same time being, say, shot and stabbed simultaneously. Okay, so the, uh, they were, the, the event, the death was overdetermined. It, was, it had more causes than it needed. So you could say that, and that would ha have to be applied quite systematically to all events that seem to be due to, um, to the effects of our experiences. So you could say that, but it looks a bit like a, a move, uh, uh, an ad hoc move, a move that's just made to to save your theory uh, that these things are both non-physical and causally effective. It's not a very elegant solution again. Uh, another option would be to say, well, maybe the physical world isn't causally closed. Maybe there are interventions from outside it. Um, so perhaps we would, when we look closely enough, we would find some neurons in the brain firing and sending signals without any physical cause at all. Neuroscientists would say, well, we just can't explain why that neuron fired at that moment and send that. It's just there's absolutely no physical explanation for it. And then we could bring in the phenomenal properties to explain it. Well, yeah, that's it's it's an option. I don't think we are yet in a position to completely rule it out. But again, it's 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 a it's a it's a big bet and that there doesn't seem to be any evidence for anything like that at the moment. Um so it's taking on a big theoretical commitment to say that. Another option is to say, well, is to give up on the idea that phenomenal properties actually uh, cause anything. Maybe the feel of the pain doesn't really do anything. It's there and it goes along with the certain brain states, but it's the brain states that are doing all the causal work. The, the pain is just uh, uh, um, comes along for, for the ride, as it were, uh, using a, an analogy from the um, 19th century um, Biologist Thomas Huxley, we could say that uh, it's like the the steam, uh, the, the the phenomenal properties are like the the steam from a from an engine. It's it's, it's they they're produced by uh, the the physical uh, activity in the brain, but they don't have any effects back on it. Okay, so what's happening in the brain 
produces these things, but then all the effects that follow are, are due entirely to, the, to, what the, to what the brain is doing, not to these, these side effects that are produced. Again, that's a possibility, but I, I think it's a pretty counterintuitive one. Uh, I mean, given where we start the idea that, that phenomenal properties are supposed to explain what it's like for us and what it's like for us seems to matter to us, seems to make a difference to us, then if we end up having to say, well, what it's like doesn't matter in that way, doesn't make a difference, then, well, we seem to be, um, we seem to have come quite away from where we started. And again, it seems that our theory here is distorting our, um, uh, our um, initial, uh, the, the picture that we started with. Or finally, of course, you might just say, well, for not these phenomenal properties, actually, they aren't uh, add-ons to the physical picture. They are just actually physical state. They actually are just states that, uh, that are mentioned in that physical description. They are maybe just brain states. They're nothing more than that. They're just patterns of neuron firing. Say so that's all they are. And it's a mistake to think they're something different. We'll, we'll come on to that one in, 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 in a moment. Um, that one certainly looks the, 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 the most the simplest um, response to this problem of causal closure. But as we'll see, there are some problems with that too. Of course, illusionism has a very simple answer to this. The phenomenal properties don't exist, so there's no problem of, of fitting them in. Um, okay, so as I mentioned, let's look at, at another way of trying to fit in phenomenal properties into this physical picture of the world, which doesn't treat them as add-ons. Um, and this is a one that's become a quite... Uh, popular recently, um, and it's this, that, that it's that phenomenality, the phenomenal properties form another level in the physical picture. They're not outside it, they're, they're part of it, they're actually another level, right at the bottom there. Uh, so the idea is that the basic physical entities themselves, the quarks or whatever the basic physical entities posited by science are, that they are themselves realized in phenomenal properties, in sort of micro-consciousnesses. The idea is that all science tells us about these basic physical entities is, is, how, is how they interact with each other, what effects they have on each other. It doesn't tell us what they are in themselves. What is, what is a, you know, a quark itself, what's it actually made of, as it were? And so the suggestion is, well, maybe they're made of phenomenality. Maybe they are, their intrinsic nature is phenomenal. They are little micro-consciousnesses. Not consciousnesses having all the sort of rich variety of experiences that we have, but having just a tiny, tiny sliver of that. Uh, and then the idea that our, is that our complex uh, human consciousnesses and the, consciousness, the consciousnesses of other animals are built up from these micro-consciousnesses, just in the way that our brains are built up, uh, from the basic physical entities that those micro-consciousnesses constitute. So the the, um, our brain is a construction of quarks and our consciousness is a construct or whatever the basic entities are and our consciousness is a construction of the micro-consciousnesses of quarks or whatever. So now that fa finds a, a place for phenomenality in the physical picture and it's, um, it doesn't have all this consequence of, of all these ad hoc laws linking the phenomenal uh, into the physical world. So it's it's quite an, an, uh, an elegant picture and it gives arguably at least, it gives uh, phenomenality, co consciousness, a, a causal role, because now all physical causation is, uh, uh, phenomenality is involved in all physical ca causation. Everything that happens in the physical world is, is, is actually um, being caused by phenomenal properties right at the bottom level. Um, it does have, have many, face many problems, and especially uh, what's called the combination problem. How do you get all these very, very simple micro-consciousnesses to combine to form a, a human consciousness, a complex human consciousness? We've, we have a sort of picture of how, we have a picture of how the basic, how atoms and how quarks combine to form atoms and atoms to molecules and molecules and so on and so forth, and how this builds up from the structural side but how do we do it from the phenomenal side? And there are, there are many problems with that. And there are other problems too with this view. And, and also equally many ingenious solutions have been proposed to these, uh, to these problems. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing uh, area of investigation. 
I might actually be perhaps the neatest form of phenomenal realism. Uh, it does have a certain sort of elegance, a certain elegance to it. I do, however, think that it's theoretically costly. For one thing, it involves a s detaching consciousness from psychology. It's natural to think that consciousness is connected with perception, with perceiving the world and uh, experiencing our, 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 our environment and our own bodies. Well, this view detaches uh, phenomenality, consciousness from psychology. Electrons and basic and quarks and basic physical entities don't have any psychological states. They don't perceive things, I assume. They don't, they don't have any sense organs or anything like that. And it also, of course, uh, uh, massively extends the range of things that have consciousness. We is we pre theoretically, I suppose, we think that we have we are conscious. Uh, many other animals are conscious, and that's it. Well, on this view, there's a sense in which everything is conscious. So every every particle, every physical particle in the universe is conscious. It may not be that these micro consciousnesses sum up to form a, a higher level consciousness in anything other than humans and animals. I mean, the suggestion isn't that that the micro consciousnesses in a rock uh, uh, combine to form a rock consciousness. Um, though that would be a matter for for um, uh, for theoretical for for theorizing, on a panpsychist view, uh, but it, it's certainly theoretically costly in that it involves supposing that consciousness is in a sense everywhere, and it's and perhaps the major problem is that it's completely untestable, because if everything were realized in consciousness in this way, it wouldn't make any difference to anything. Uh, do any observations that we might make, because the idea is that the, the higher levels all continue exactly as they uh, as they would do without that, uh, without that realize realize that fundamental realization in consciousness. The basic physical property, the basic physical processes would all continue in exactly the same way as would all the higher level processes that they realize. Everything would go on just the same, whether or not it were realized in consciousness at the basic um, level. At the most basic, at the most basic level, and of course we can't, we can't. There's no way we can detect what these intrinsic properties of, 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 the fundamental particles are. Um, all we can, all we can know about them is how they interact. So there's a, this mysterious phenomenal level right down there at the, at the at the at the bottom of the picture, which we can never observe, and whose presence makes no detectable differences to anything. So. It's, I mean, the, the argument would be, yes, but it does explain how our consciousness fits into the world, and okay, uh, but still it's a, it's a rather costly solution to that problem. And uh, uh, again, that doesn't rule it out. It doesn't show that it's, that it's um, not, a, not a possible view, but I, I think it shows it's not, a, it's not an economical view. Okay, so those are options for those for people who think that um, phenomenal properties don't f don't are, are not physical in the sense that they are properties described within that initial uh, framework of uh, the, the psychological, neural, and cellular, and so on. That they're not just brain properties; they're not physical in that sense of being actually actually being brain properties. They're either add-ons to it or or a new level at the very base of the physical world. Um, what about saying that? Well, actually, phenomenal properties, they're real, they're real, they're, they're not an illusion, as illusionists claim, but they are just ordinary physical properties, properties of the brain, say. That, uh, having a, what we call it, having an, uh, an experience of phenomenal blue is just for your brain to be in a certain state. Not for your brain to be in a certain state and there to be some correlated non-physical state, but just for your brain to be in that physical state. That's all Phenomenal blueness is a certain brain state. So this is a, this is a physicalist uh, form of realism. Okay, so let's let's have a look at this and see what uh, why uh, the illusionists um, reject this. Okay, so you may think the obvious way to go then is some form of physicalist realism, uh, realism about phenomenal properties, because well, isn't it obvious they exist, and 
physicalism because it avoids all the problems that I've just been discussing, all the problems of fitting phenomenal properties into the physical world. If they are just physical features, if they are just features of the brain, then there's no problem. Um, and I, this is, I guess, the, the majority view among philosophers of consciousness. Um, but I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's, it's, it's really a coherent option. I think it, when you look at it closely, it, it either leaves us with an explanatory gap or it collapses into illusionism. Let me try to explain why. Um, the, um, the illustration here uh, is the it's a piece of artwork by Art Ambassadin, uh, which he, he did for me in Greenland in 2014. And it refers to a 2012 paper of mine in which I introduced some uh, 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 concepts for different kinds of qualia. This is the crucial question to ask uh, about uh, phenomenal realism. What exactly are we being realist about? We've been using these words, phenomenal properties, uh, phenomenal consciousness, phenomenality, uh, qualia, uh, what it is likeness, and so on. But what does what do the what do these really come down to? And um, this is in itself a, 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 a an extremely difficult question. Um, but here are, here is here are a couple of distinctions that I introduced in this paper uh, using this um, uh, uh, soft drink metaphor. Classic qualia. Now, classic qualia are qualia as um, as uh, uh, Dennett uh, introduced them in his um, nineteen eighty eight paper. Uh, introspectable properties of experience that are intrinsic. They're not functionally uh, can't be characterized in functional terms. They're ineffable. You can't describe what they're like in themselves. They're subjective. They're completely private. And um, there's another feature that, that uh, Dennett uh, adds, which I have mentioned there, which is that they're directly apprehensible. You, you, you know them immediately without any kind of intervening process of um, uh, in, inference or um, representation, I guess. And then we can say that strong realism about uh, phenomenality is the view that classic qualia exist. Uh, that experiences really do have those those properties, and if you take that view, then it's it's quite hard to be a physicalist because it's hard to see how physical properties, the sort of properties that can be investigated by third person science, could be ineffable and intrinsic and subjective in that way. I mean, if they're subjective, if they're completely private, then there's no way that third person science could investigate them. So it seems that a a, a physicalist can't be a realist about classic qualia. Now here's another notion which is the, uh, if you like, the antithesis of, of classic qualia. It's zero qualia, not really any qualia at all. The properties of, exp the, by this I mean that this is uh, a, a term I coined, the properties of experiences that dispose us to judge that they have introspectable qualitative properties that are intrinsic, ineffable and subjective. So really the, uh, to say that an experience has uh, zero qualia is to say that there's something about it that disposes us to judge that it has classic qualia. And of course illusionists think that experiences have zero qualia. They think we're disposed to judge that our experiences have qualia. That's the illusion. And so there must be some features about them that dispose us to do that. So illusionism, uh, strong illusionism, I'll explain why I say strong there, is the view that only zero qualia exists, no classic qualia at all. Now, physicalists, physicalist realists, they have to reject classic qualia, as, as, as I just explained, but they want, they don't want to say that there's nothing more than zero qualia, they don't, they don't, but they want to be realists, and zero qualia uh, are, um, are not um, really qualia. And so here's, here's a quotation from Michael Tai, first of all, which... Uh, uh, expresses his rejection of classic qualia. He says, 
There is a use of the term qualia under which qualia are intrinsic, introspectively accessible, non-representational qualities of experience. In my view, there are no qualia conceived of in this way. They are a philosophical myth. So he, he uh, um, agrees with, with um, Dennett in rejecting those. Uh, but he, he doesn't agree with Dennett in rejecting qualia and phenomenal properties outright. He goes, uh, he goes on, well, actually this is the, in the preceding um, uh, sentence, philosophers often use the term qualia to refer to the introspectively accessible properties of experience that characterize what it is like to have them. Now, in this standard broad sense of the term, it's very difficult to deny that there are qualia. So he wants to say that the, there are properties that uh, make it like something for us to have. There are properties of experience that make it like something for us to have those experiences. They're not these heavy-duty classic qualia, but they are still um, uh, uh, they are still more, I, I think he would say, than mere dispositions to judge that our experiences have qualia of some kind. And here's another quote from a uh, quotation from Peter Carruthers. Many philosophers use the term qualia liberally to refer to those properties of mental states, whatever they may be, in virtue of which the states in question are phenomenally conscious. On this usage, qualia, subjective feel, and what it is likeness are all just notational variants of one another. And on this usage, it is very, it is beyond dispute that there are such things as qualia. Now again, uh, and kind of this accompanies that by a statement rejecting qualia in the classic sense as intrinsic and ineffable and non-representational and so on. So what, uh, and these are just two samples, I think this, this is a very common move in um, uh, the philosophy of consciousness over the last uh, 20 years or so is to say, well, okay, th there aren't um, qualia in that strong classic sense, but there certainly are qualia in some weaker sense. Um, so what they're introducing is, is what I've suggested is, is they've suggest, <coughs> I'm suggesting that they've introduced this notion of diet qualia, a sort of watered down version of qualia that is still stronger than zero qualia. Diet qualia in this sense are just the phenomenal characters of experience, the, the subjective feels, the what it is likenesses. And it seems that these things are real, even if the heavy duty, quality, ineffable, intrinsic, uh, non representational, non functional qualia are not. And so then we can, if strong realism is the belief in that classic qualia exist, we can say that weak realism is the view that classic qualia don't exist, but diet qualia do. And that could in fact be regarded as a weak form of illusionism because it, it's, it's saying that classic qualia are illusory, but diet qualia are not. A strong illusionism is the view that uh, neither classic qualia nor diet qualia exist. Um, and when I use the term illusionism on its own, I always mean strong illusionism. Um, I think perhaps one reason for um, why philosophers uh, have, have um, made this distinction is that they've, um, uh, accept, my physicalist philosophers have made this distinction, is that they accept that Dennett has shown that classic qualia are, um, are um, unacceptable from a physicalist point of view, but they're not prepared to go the, the whole way and endorse illusion, something like illusionism as Dennett does. Um, and so they, they try to... Um, uh, uh, articulate a, 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 a middle way position. I, I, I should point out, though, as, as uh, should remember, we should remember, though, as I pointed out last time, that it's not clear that Dennett's arguments against qualia turn on those uh, on that particular definition uh, of qualia as uh, ineffable, intrinsic, and so on. Uh, as we saw, the arguments really turn on the question of how we can know our qualia. Um, classic or diet. And uh, I think Dennett is quite clear that, he's, he, he, I, uh, that he would reject diet qualia too. Okay, so, but anyway, that's the, that's the position that, that, uh, that a lot of, um, uh, that many physicalist philosophers adopt. Um, uh, oh, and that's the paper in which I, I um, introduced these distinctions and uh, outline the case against uh, uh, um, 
the diet qualia. Let me try and summarize that case now. I think the diet qualia are, are, are no more, um, um, are, that we should reject diet qualia just as we should reject um, uh, classic qualia. I don't think it, uh, there, it's, it's a coherent notion. I think when you press it, it either tends to inflate into, that of, into the notion of classic qualia or deflate into that of zero qualia. Okay, so we can put the case against diet qualia as a challenge, I think, for uh, for diet qualia realists. Here we have in the in the little in the little diagrams there we have uh, three three experiences: an experience with zero qualia. Here that that's represented by the the pattern of dots, and these are just physical features that dispose the person who possesses the experience to judge that it has qualia in some stronger sense classic qualia maybe. And then at the bottom we have an experience that really does have classic qualia. Okay. So um, it has this, 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 this ineffable intrinsic quality to it. Um, uh, now, physicalist realists want to say, well, experiences have something more than the uh, uh, merely zero qualia uh, and something less than classic qualia. So they have something in the middle there. Okay. Now, what exactly is this is this thing in the middle this this the, the represented by this pale uh, pink glow now the realist must say that diet qualia are something more than zero qualia if they're to be a realist okay um if all if all that diet qualia come down to are uh properties physical properties that dispose us to judge that the experience that possesses them have has an in, uh, ineffable intrinsic feel then that's just zero qualia, and the, the realist is, in fact, an illusionist uh, who just doesn't accept the name. So the realist must say that uh, an experience could have properties that dispose its possessor to judge that it has classic qualia, uh, or perhaps some weaker form such as diet qualia, without it actually having diet quality that's the, the the first one has to be a possibility it has it has to be a possibility a distinction there has to be a possibility of having just zero qualia without having diet qualia diet qualia must be something more than zero qualia so then what is an experience with merely zero qualia missing what else would it have to have in order to to uh, to count as having diet qualia well obviously not the full blown uh, intrinsic ineffable fields, the classic qualia. So what would it be? Well, the we're told that it would have to have a phenomenal character, a subjective feel, or what it is likeness. Okay, but what's that? What is that? And why doesn't that present a hard problem of its own? Why is that any less problematic and difficult to explain than classic qualia? So we can press this challenge a bit by asking this. Are diet qualia just functional features of experience, features defined by the, the role they play, what, what causes them and what effects they have? Like zero qualia. Zero qualia are defined as properties that have certain effects on our judgments and beliefs. Well, if so, which functional features? We're assuming that these are all experiences that have, and that they have all the normal range of uh, effects on, all psychological effects on... Uh, memory and uh, belief formation and reasoning and emotional state and all that and we're also assuming that they all have uh, they all create the disposition to believe that um, that they all that they all have features that dispose us to believe that they have classic quality they all have zero quality the question is whether they have something more as well so what functional features would an experience with diet qualia have that an experience with zero qualia wouldn't? Uh, well, it's 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 very hard to see what the answer to that could be. After all, it's we can imagine zombies who are behaviorally identical uh, to us and whose brains perform all the same functions without uh, without there having any qualia at all, um, apart from zero qualia. So. What is the the illusionist account, the account that speaks only of zero qualia? What is it missing out? What functions is it missing?
if these if diet qualia are functional features, what functions uh, of experience is the illusionist ignoring? What does experience do that the illusionist doesn't recognise? That's a challenge. On the other hand, if diet qualia are not functional features, if they are something like intrinsic features, like classic classic qualia, then and then how on earth can we explain them? So we can so we can put this as a a, a dilemma for physicalist realists. If they can only explain our phenomenal judgments and our other reactions, then they're just closet illusionists. If they can only explain things that can equally well be explained by, uh, uh, in terms of, of zero qualia, then they're realists in name only. On the other hand, if physicalist realists say that diet qualia are not functional features, then how are they going to explain them? Um, we reductively explain a, a, a phenomenon by characterizing it in functional terms and then identifying the mechanisms that perform that function. But if diet qualia can't be characterized as, uh, in functional terms, then we can't apply that strategy. So it looks as if there's going to be a, a, an explanatory gap there. I, the, the, the physical, the, the the realist can say they they might say that these features just are physical features. They're not something, uh, they're not add-ons to the physical picture. Um, but we can't explain uh, how they how they come about. How it's um, we can't give the kind of reductive explanation of them that we can give of other physical features. So there is. Uh, 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 so there's a there's so there's a, a dilemma I think for um, physicalist realists. If they say that diet qualia are just functional features, then I think their realism collapses into illusionism because illusionists can happily admit that all those functional features exist. If they say they're not functional features, then they have to accept that there's an explanatory gap and so uh, they fail to ex explain consciousness. So as I say their physicalist realism either collapses into illusionism or fails to explain consciousness. Uh, so again I don't think that physicalist realism here is an attractive position either. Um, it either fails to solve the hard problem, fails to, to, to really answer the hard problem, or it just collapses into illusionism. I think if you look at what physicalist realists actually say, then you, it, it, it actually has an implicitly um, illusionist form. Uh, they set out to explain uh, diet qualia, phenomenal, uh, the phenomenal fe subjective feel, what it is likeness, and so on. But what their theories actually explain, uh, if they're successful, is our judgments about phenomenality, subjective feel, and so on. Why we, why we judge that our experiences have something we call a, a subjective feel, or what it is likeness, a, an inner aspect, a subjective aspect to them. And uh, if that is all they can explain, then I think they are, um, uh, at bottom, simply illusionist theories, uh, dressed up as realist theories. Okay, so that's a summary of the argument from uh, theoretical simplicity, from theoretical economy. The idea, the idea there is that the illusionist view um, offers a much simpler, more elegant um, view of how consciousness fits into the natural world. Consciousness itself is perfectly real. It doesn't have these, but it doesn't have these strange uh, properties that are recalcitrant to explanation. And so we don't have to get ourselves in tangles uh, worrying about how these properties fit in and uh, 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 how we can uh, explain them. And it's worth noting that this is not a particularly new um, uh, approach to, uh, to thinking about, um, about consciousness. If we go back to the 1950s when um, philosophers were first de developing modern uh, materialist, physicalist theories of mind, theories that uh, forms of identity theory, which said that the mind and the brain are simply the same thing, and that mental states are simply un, are simply are brain states. They tended to take this view. I mean, uh, and the, um, we look at um, 
philosophers such as Ulin Place, J.J.C. Uh, J. J. Smart, who I mentioned earlier, David Armstrong and so on, um, they tended to take this hard line on phenomenal uh, consciousness, that uh, it simply had to be, uh, that it was simply a fallacy to think that uh, these phenomenal properties existed. And here's a quotation from Ulin Place, um, and you, you can see there actually a picture of uh, Ulin's brain, which is preserved at the University of Adelaide, where he taught for some years with the, um, with the, with the question, did this brain contain the consciousness of UT Place. That's something he wanted to, um, uh, he wanted his brain to pres be preserved and uh, uh, in that way, and displayed in that way. And he says this, he speaks of the phenomenological fallacy, which is the mistake of supposing that when the subject describes his experience, when he describes how things look, sound, smell, taste, or feel to him, he is describing the literal properties of objects and events on a peculiar sort of internal cinema or television screen. You notice the anticipation there of, of, of Dennett's Cartesian theatre. And Place is, is quite clear. He thinks that's a fallacy. There, are, there is no show there. There are no properties of that kind there. We have to, just get, we have to get rid of these properties if we're going to be physicalists. Uh, and I think that's, um, that's a lesson that some later physicalists haven't, um, haven't taken fully on board. Okay, so that's the case for illusionism from theoretical e economy, for thinking that it's a more elegant, uh, simpler um, approach to, to consciousness. Of course, we, the, um, from the illusionist perspective, there's still a, a huge amount to explain about consciousness. We have to explain all the functions, all the immensely complex perceptual and reactive processes and introspective processes that are involved in consciousness, what we don't have to do is to try to find a place in uh, our picture of the world for these elusive phenomenal properties that seem so recalcitrant to explanation in normal ways. Um, so, in a sense, this is just an extension of the argument from anomalousness earlier. If something seems so recalcitrant to explanation, so... Uh, difficult to fit into the picture of the world that's the integrated picture of the world that science is place is, is painting and maybe the sensible thing to do is just to wonder if if it's it, 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 that then the sensible thing to do is to suspect that it's that it's not real and concentrate on explaining why we think it's real okay we'll move on now to another argument the debunking argument and this is an argument that has been um, discussed in some detail um, by David Chalmers in his work. Chalmers is not an illusionist, of course, but he thinks there are um, uh, some good arguments for it, particularly this one, the debunking argument. And he, he sets out the argument himself and uh, gives a lot of attention to it. Okay, so it's briefly this. If we can explain why we believe that a certain thing exists without supposing that it does in fact exist, then our belief in its existence isn't justified. So uh, take UFOs. If uh, people have a lot, of, there's a lot of reports of people uh, seeing UFOs. These people uh, are often strongly convinced that they that they've seen uh, alien uh, spaceships. And if we can explain why they believe that without supposing that they actually did see an alien spaceship, say because they uh, saw some strange cloud formation or they saw a secret military aircraft or whatever, and because they had they interpreted it in a certain way because of all they'd read about UFOs and so on. If we can explain their beliefs about UFOs in those sorts of terms, in terms of other experiences of other things and the psychological, um, um, and their own psychological um uh, state, then there's no reason to think that UFOs exist. We might say similar things about some religious beliefs. If we can provide psychological explanations of why people have certain religious beliefs, beliefs say that they've had um, uh, some revelatory um, uh, religious experience, if we can explain what happened in, in psychological terms or in uh, 
uh, in neuroscientific terms, then we've no reason to take the belief uh, serious, no reason to think that the belief is justified. Belief in the thing has been debunked. That's the phrase that's used, perhaps perhaps not the um, the most sensitive phrase, but one that's used. Uh, and there's a picture here of um, Philip J. Klass, who was a, a debunker of um, of UFO theories, known as the Sherlock Holmes of ufology. Now, of course, the fact that a belief has been debunked in this way, that belief in something like UFOs or God has been debunked in this way, doesn't show that the thing doesn't exist. It just shows that we no reason to think it exists. Um, it could still exist, but it would be a big coincidence if it did. The reports that um, the believers give us are no, are no um, grounds for thinking that it exists. So here's a quotation from David Chalmers in which he uh, sums up the, uh, the debunking argument. If the explanation of our beliefs about X, where X might be UFOs or God or whatever, is independent of X, then our beliefs about X will themselves be independent of X. That is to say, if we can explain why people believe something without supposing that the thing actually exists and that they've come in contact with it, then those beliefs themselves exist quite independently of of, of the, whatever the thing is, God or UFOs or whatever. And if so, it will be entirely a matter of luck whether those beliefs are correct so, the belief, so that the beliefs are not justified. So if what caused a person to believe in UFOs had nothing at all to do with UFOs, then their belief in UFOs certainly wasn't justified. And it would be a, a big coincidence if, if it were true. Okay, so we can we can sum that up here. We we start with a position where we have a bunch of reports of UFOs. Okay, we, we, we go and interview all these people who who claim to have seen UFOs, and we record their testimony. And prima facie, that gives us reason to believe in UFOs. But then suppose we dig a bit deeper, and we find that all of these reports can be explained in other ways, without supposing that the people had really seen a UFO. Uh, whenever they report a UFO, it turns out that there was a some strange cloud formation present or some military aircraft or whatever it might have been. And we can explain or what, we can explain all of these reports in terms that don't mention UFOs at all. We can explain what caused the people to believe they'd seen a UFO without actually uh, uh, mentioning UFOs at all. And in that case, we would no longer have a reason to believe in UFOs. The reports themselves would be um, discredited as sources of evidence. So we don't believe in UFOs. Now, how does this apply to consciousness? Well, the thought is that there's good reason to think that we can explain our beliefs about phenomenal consciousness without supposing that it exists. Uh, and here I want to introduce uh, what Chalmers calls the meta-problem. The meta-problem is the problem of explaining our intuitions about phenomenal consciousness. So I mean, Chalmers thinks there's a, there's a problem of phenomenal consciousness, the hard problem, phenomenal consciousness, consciousness exists, and uh, we want to try to explain it, and that's a hard problem. That constitutes a hard problem. But there's another problem here: the meta problem, the problem of why we think that there's a hard problem, why we think that consciousness is is um, uh, uh, hard to explain, why we have the in intuitions about consciousness being non-physical and so on. So intuitions about all the problems that consciousness poses, about how to explain it, how it's related to the physical world, all the things we've we've talked about and more. Uh, more broadly, we, we might see the meta problem as the problem of explaining all the heterophenomenal logical data, all our reports about our own experience, about our, our inner worlds of, of, of experience, including the, the very belief that phenomenal consciousness exists, that we do have this, this private inner world. Now, the crucial point here is that the meta problem doesn't seem to, to be a, itself a hard problem, because 
we can expl we can characterize the things that need explaining here in functional terms. We need to explain the production of certain cognitive states or linguistic reports. And there's every reason to think that we can do this in, in psychological terms and then, then explain that in neural terms and so on. Uh, explaining reports and judgments and other reactions, these are among the easy problems of consciousness, the problems that can be characterized in functional terms. And it seems likely that the solution to the meta problem will involve positing introspective processes, processes that monitor our experiences and uh, create models of the uh, of, of our own perceptual activity and generate beliefs and judgments about them. Uh, and we, I talked about this briefly in the first lecture in in uh, describing how the illusionist would account for our uh, sense that we have. Uh, that we are phenomenally conscious. And uh, so solving the meta problem is really equivalent to what I called the illusion problem, the problem of explaining why we have this sense of being phenomenally conscious and having this uh, inner world of uh, mysterious um, uh, phenomenal uh, properties, mysterious mental qualities. And uh, that is a reference to the paper in which Chalmers introduced the meta problem. And, quite an influential paper. So, um, so if you remember, I, we had this, uh, I introduced this picture in the, uh, in the first lecture. It's, uh, uh, we have the first order perceptual processes, uh, which uh, with the, the, the red arrow on the left, and then the reactions that they generate with the green arrow. And then instead of phenomenal consciousness being produced, there being real phenomenal fields uh, produced, uh, accompanying the, this perceptual activity, uh, we have uh, mechanisms of introspection, again, which, tar which target our own perceptual and reactive states, um, uh, uh, supplying information about them, the, the, the second red arrow, the red arrow on the right, and then produce a whole bunch of reactions uh, to those, including uh, the phenomenal reports and judgments and so on that, that are the, um, uh, the uh, uh, target of the meta-problem. And in his paper, Chalmers surveys a variety of models of um, of, of how this um, of uh, how these introspective uh, processes might uh, explain our um, problem intuitions about consciousness. We will look at some of it, those suggestions in the fifth lecture because they are um, essentially solutions to to the illusion problem. They are actually uh, varieties of illusionist theory. Okay, so. We have this uh, approach to explaining our judgments and reports about phenomenal consciousness, okay, through um, by appealing to mechanisms of introspection. So now we can tell a similar sort of debunking story to the one about UFOs. Okay, so we start with this bunch of phenomenal judgments and reports, the, th the things that people say about their own experience, about uh, that it's like something to be them that they have that they're aware of this they're acquainted with this um inner world of mental qualities and uh, which seem strange and non-physical and so on and produce a hard problem and those reports give us reason prima facie reason to believe that phenomenal consciousness is real and that there is a hard problem but now we add in these these theories these introspective models and they explain all the things we're inclined to judge and report about phenomenal consciousness, including the kind of things we're judged, to, we're inclined to say to ourselves, to report to ourselves about our inner lives. And so, by a parity of, of reasoning, uh, that explanation undercuts the justification that those reports gave us for believing in phenomenal consciousness itself, and we uh, we have no reason to believe in it anymore. So this is the debunking argument uh, for illusionism. Now, of course, all that assumes that we can give a, a complete explanation of our phenomenal intuitions and reports in terms of uh, introspective processes. But uh, that's not an unreasonable hypothesis, uh, given as we... as. Uh, as I said, that they that that explaining these things is a matter of explaining functions. 
so suppose suppose it's true suppose we can do that then phenomenal realism has been debunked right well the realist isn't isn't quite out yet the realist can 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 uh, come back um and they can point out quite rightly that the phenom that the, uh, the debunking arg debunking argument doesn't prove that phenomenal consciousness doesn't exist it just proves at most that we're not justified in believing that it exists and that it would be a a large coincidence if it did and then the the realist will um, will insist that that it does exist that uh, um, phenomenal consciousness does exist when we when we're in pain, when we're in pain, it's 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 not just that certain processes are happening in our brains and certain psychological reactions are being um, generated. It's uh, it's that we really are feeling pain in the phenomenal sense. We're really acquainted with a, with a, with a mental quality of, of of pain, and that we're more sure of that of the reality of, of phenomenal pain than we are of the than we could be of the 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 the, the, the soundness of the debunking argument so we really do feel phenomenal pain uh, even though we would believe that we did even if we didn't um, so what are the options for the realist here how can the realist um, how can the realist defend this view um, well again it's a matter of finding a place for phenomenal consciousness in the in the picture we're developing of the explanation of our phenomenal judgments so we have this this picture now where um, our phenomenal judgments and reports and other reactions are all fully explained by by introspective processes in the brain but the realist still wants to have consciousness somewhere in the picture so where could it be well one option would be to say that phenomenal consciousness isn't something independent of the mechanisms, mechanisms mentioned in our explanation of the reports and judgments and that it's not true that the explanation we gave was completely independent of phenomenal consciousness because the processes we mentioned in that explanation uh, some of the states we mentioned in that explanation were just conscious states they were the same thing we just didn't give them that name so we could say we could identify consciousness with some of the states mentioned in the explanation of our judgments now this of course will be a physicalist uh, form of realism uh, we'd be saying that the consciousness gets into the picture by being the same thing as uh, some of the physical states uh, that produce our judgments about it so we might identify phenomenal consciousness with the perceptual states that are monitored by introspection um, or perhaps we might identify it with the introspective states that are doing the monitoring. In both cases, we'd be identifying phenomenal consciousness with some of the states mentioned in the explanation of our phenomenal reports and judgments. And therefore, the explanation of those reports and judgments would no longer be independent of uh, phenomenal consciousness. And so the debunking argument wouldn't go through. Uh, now, my my worry about this is the same as the one I, 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 I mentioned earlier when discussing Diet Qualia. In what sense would this be a form of phenomenal realism? Uh, what, why would these states, these perceptual or introspective uh, states, count as possessing anything more than zero Qualia? We can pin the label uh, phenomenally conscious onto these, onto these states, but what is that adding to the picture that the illusionist describes the illusionist says that uh, these are the processes that are involved in generating our phenomenal reports and judgments the now the realist says agrees with that and wants to call some of those states phenomenally conscious but what is that adding to the picture apart from the name what ex what what extra uh, feature of these states is being referred to other than the features that are mentioned in the illusionist account which of course uh, uh, captures all the uh, all, all the psychological um, uh, and behavioural reactions. And taking this line would really, I think, be changing the meaning of the term phenomenal consciousness. We introduced phenomenal. The, the notion of phenomenal consciousness was introduced um, from a first-person 
perspective. It was supposed to be a name for what experience is like subjectively. And how are we going to use it for whatever it is, whatever processes in the brain cause us to have these beliefs about phenomenal consciousness, then we seem to have we seem to have have, have changed the meaning quite quite radically. I, I mean, in fact, one could hold on to belief in anything uh, in the face of a debunking argument uh, by taking that sort of line. I, su I suppose. Um, uh, well, look, take UFO beliefs. Suppose um, you're a UFO believer and you have all these uh, uh, UFO uh, reports and uh, and suppose the, the debunker comes along and shows how they can be, all of these reports can be fully explained uh, by, uh, without reference to, 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 to actual UFOs, they can be explained as, as observations of uh, sightings of strange saucer-shaped cloud formations and so on, and and and, uh, and they can all be explained away in that way. And suppose the uh, the UFO believer then says, "Well, yes, but all I meant by UFOs was whatever caused the beliefs about them, whatever caused the reports." So, um, really. UFOs, it turns out that UFOs are just clouds. And so I still believe in UFOs. Uh, you've not debunked my beliefs at all. Um, you've just um, shown me that I'm really, really um, uh, a believer in clouds. Well, I'm glad you could take that view, and it, it, it preserves realism of a form. But I think that would be, um, I think most people, people who believe in UFOs would find that a rather unsatisfactory form of UFO realism. If you went along to a UFO convention and started talking about clouds and saying you were describing uh, UFOs, I think they would say that you would, um, they would feel that you were debunking uh, their beliefs rather than uh, confirming them. Uh, so I don't think we can uh, save phenomenal realism by redefining phenomenal consciousness as whatever it is that that uh, uh, causes our beliefs about phenomenal consciousness. Okay, so so that sort of physicalist response I don't think works. Um, what about what about a, a, a non-physicalist response? Here's another option. You could say, well, look, um, th th here's another option for the realist. They could say, okay, so our phenomenal judgments and reports they're fully explained by by these introspective processes in the brain, but phenomenal consciousness does still exist. And the phenomenal states that we're in correlate reliably with the reports and judgments that we make. So when the introspective processes in the brain dispose us to judge that we're having a pain quality, say, we actually really are having a pain quality. The pain quality is quite independent of what um, is going on in the brain. Uh, and it played no part in the explanation of our uh, reports of pain, but nevertheless it was there and perfectly real. And similarly for all our phenomenal reports, whenever we make, whenever our introspective mechanisms lead us to make a certain phenomenal report, there is uh, coincidentally a, 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 a an actual distinct phenomenal state that, that fits that description. And the phenomenal realist might go, go further and say that, that phenomenal consciousness is not just correlated with the mechanisms that produce the reports and judgments, but actually realizes them at some fundamental level in the perhaps in a panpsychist way. So the physical processes that generate our, 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 our um, phenomenal reports are at some deep level realized in uh, phenomenal consciousness. And those realizing states correlate with the judgments. So that it turns out that our judgments are in some sense actually caused by consciousness and uh, correlate with consciousness and so are true and in a sense uh, 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 caused by uh, consciousness. So that seems like that seems like a, a, a possibility for the um, for the phenomenal realist. So conscious states are distinct from but correlate with the states that generate our phenomenal judgments and they might also realize those states and so be causally involved in the production of the reports and judgments. Again, that seems a, a possible position. I've called it lucky phenomenal realism because it's even if uh, 
consciousness weren't there and weren't realising the introspective processes, the introspective processes would still be generating exactly the same uh, 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 judgments and reports. So it's lucky that consciousness is there uh, and is correlated with those uh, judgments and reports uh, and is actually um, uh, playing some sort of causal role at, uh, uh, at some level. And I think we can bring out how lucky this is by, by again making a comparison with UFOs. I, it could be that all UFO reports are, in fact, uh, uh, can in fact be fully explained by sightings of natural phenomena, or the strange weather conditions, uh, strange clouds. I think that's a lenticular cloud. Um, but that coincidentally, whenever there was one of these strange clouds around that caused a UFO report there was also a UFO there as well, perhaps hiding behind the cloud. So the UFOs reliably correlate with the things that cause UFO reports. So the UFOs don't actually cause the reports, uh, but they're reliably correlated with the things that do. Whenever there's something that causes a UFO report, there's also actually a, a, a UFO there. Uh, and it, it might even be that the UFOs cause the things that cause the reports. It could be maybe that maybe UFOs cause these strange clouds to appear and hide behind them. Okay, so that would be that would be equivalent to consciousness realizing the introspective processes that generate the results, that then generate the reports. So the analogy here is that uh, the, the cloud represents the introspective mechanisms, the flying saucer represents consciousness. Uh, Flying saucers correlate with the clouds in the way that consciousness correlates with the introspective um, mechanisms, and that flying saucers cause the, um, the the clouds in the way that consciousness uh, that consciousness phenomenal consciousness might realise uh, the introspective um, processes. Okay, so that's that's a possibility. That would be what I call lucky UFO realism. That. Uh, all UFO reports have a an explanation that doesn't mention UFOs, but they all happen to be true and were in fact caused at least indirectly by UFOs. And that would be a, a lucky form of, UFO, uh, of UFO, that would be a lucky form of UFO realism. Okay, so that's lucky UFO realism and similarly um, lucky uh, Phenomenal realism claims that uh, judgments and reports about phenomenal consciousness can be fully explained in terms of introspective um, mechanisms in the brain. Um, but nonetheless, consciousness, phenomenal consciousness does exist and it correlates with those reports in a reliable way so that when, we, when the introspective mechanisms generate the um, uh, the judgment that we're in a certain phenomenal state, we are actually in that phenomenal state, and uh, these phenomenal states play a realizing role and hence uh, a causal role in the production of those of those uh, uh, judgments and reports. Okay, so that's a a possible position. Lucky phenomenal realism could be true, but what reason uh, do we have to think that it is true? Uh, and after all, the um, phenomenal, real, phenomenal realists, uh, in, in responding to the de debunking argument, they don't um, merely say that phenomenal consciousness could exist and could play this role. They say that we we we, we know it exists, or we, we can be extremely confident that it exists. Maybe more confident than we can be of the of um, of the uh, soundness of the debunking argument. So, what justifies that confidence? How could we how can we know that? Uh, it, 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 it can't be because of the introspective processes. The uh, introspective processes are monitoring our experiences, our perceptual states, considered as states of the brain. They won't, they don't monitor states that happen to be correlated with those brain states, uh, and they don't monitor the states that happen to realize those. Um, uh, those brain states. In general, we're not aware of, even if we're aware of our own mental uh, processes, we're not aware of states that 
correlate with them or realize them. I mean, when I'm in a certain mental state, there will be a certain pattern of electrical activity in my brain and across my scalp. Uh, but even if I'm introspectively aware of being in that mental state, I won't be in, I won't be introspectively aware of that pattern of electrical activity, even though it correlates with the mental state. I'd need some sep separate kind of introspective mechanism that tracked the electrical the patterns of electrical activity. Similarly, um, my mental states and processes are realized in neural ones and uh, and electrochemical ones and so on. Uh, and introspection doesn't make me aware of that doesn't tell me, otherwise neuroscience would be extremely easy. We'd be simply able to look into our brains and, and, uh, and, and, and know the, 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 the kinds of chemical and electrochemical activities involved in, in uh, realizing our mental states. So introspection isn't going to uh, make us aware of phenomenal consciousness on this view. Um, that's going to make us think we're aware of it. So then there's a challenge for the phenomenal realist, a problem for the phenomenal realist. They want to say that um, we, uh, we do know uh, that we're phenomenal conscious, we do know that we're in pain, uh, and that our belief that we are is, is justified. If introspection isn't providing that knowledge and justification, what is? And this is what I call the, the hard meta problem. It's a separate problem. It's a problem not of now of explaining our phenomenal reports and judgments, which we can do in, in terms of introspective mechanisms. It's a, it's a problem of explaining how we know that lucky phenomenal realism is true. How we know that there really are, um, uh, how we know that phenomenal consciousness exists, despite the fact that introspection doesn't give us any reason to believe that it exists. And that's the uh, the paper where I uh, introduced this um, uh, the hard meta problem. Okay, so what can the um, uh, the realist say here? I think the realist has got to reply that we have a distinct kind of awareness of our, of our phenomenal properties of our phenomenal consciousness that's separate from introspection. There's introspection. Maybe introspection can tell us something about our our, um, our mental processes considered uh, as, as brain processes. Um, it can tell us perhaps about our beliefs and desires and maybe our emotions and things like that. Uh, but when it comes to the phenomenal properties of our mental states, we have a distinct kind of awareness, an awareness that is... Uh, separate from introspection. We, a sort of, we might call it, we might call it a, a, a sixth sense for consciousness. Uh, imagine what the, uh, the UFO realist might say, confronted with the, uh, with the debunking argument for UFOs. They might say, um, suppose they subscribe to the lucky UFO realism view. They say that, yes, it's true that my uh, the, the, what I actually observed that night was just a strange cloud formation, and that's what caused my belief that I'd seen a UFO. But all the same, there was a UFO there, and it was hiding behind the cloud, and it actually produced the cloud and caused the cloud to appear to, so it could hide behind it. And we say to the person, well, uh, how, how, do you, how do you know that? What makes you so sure of that? After all, you've just admitted that what all you saw was a cloud, and that it was a cloud that uh, caused you to believe you'd seen a UFO. And the UFO person replies, well, I've got a, a sixth sense for UFOs. I know it, it was only a cloud that I saw, and it was a cloud that caused me to believe I'd seen a UFO, but I've just, just got this sense that there really was a UFO there all the same. And so it's going to have to be a bit like that with with phenomenal consciousness. The phenomenal realist is going to have to say, well, I, I know that my beliefs about phenomenal consciousness, uh, my belief that I'm experiencing phenomenal pain, say, uh, is produced by these mechanisms in the brain, okay, which um, don't aren't actually sensitive to phenomenal consciousness. Um, but nonetheless, I know that phenomenal consciousness exists, that phenomenal pain is real. Uh, I, I can just I can tell that in some other way. I've got some further sense for uh, my own phenomenal states. 
in a, a, that's separate from introspection, or that supplements introspection, a sixth sense for consciousness. And indeed, many phenomenal uh, realists uh, accept this, accept that we have a, a distinct way of access, a distinct mode of access to our phenomenal properties uh, that is quite different from the psychological mechanisms of introspection. Um, they accept that we have mechanisms of introspection that uh, uh, produce beliefs about um, many aspects of our minds and mental processes, um, and which may be uh, unreliable. We may sometimes be uh, mistaken about our own motivations and about uh, uh, our, the, the, the causes of our own actions. But when it comes to the phenomenal aspects of experience, the the, the qualitative aspect, what it's like, these phenomenal properties are presented to us in a, a quite a different way. We are directly acquainted with them. There's no mechanism involved. Uh, there's me, whatever exactly I am in, in this context, and my phenomenal properties, and there's, a, there's no gap between us, as it were. I, I, I know them when I attend to them uh, in a way that's immediate and that leaves no room for error if I'm uh, if I'm uh, if I'm attentive. So there's this special relation between me and my phenomenal properties, relation of direct acquaintance, and that's what underwrites uh, the conv uh, our conviction that um, that. Phenomenal consciousness is real, despite the debunking argument. So the debunking argument shows that we don't need to mention phenomenal consciousness in explaining our phenomenal judgments and reports, and to that extent that those judgments and reports don't give us any reason to believe in uh, the existence of phenomenal consciousness. But we have a separate kind of access to phenomenal consciousness, which underwrites our, con uh, our conviction that it exists and allows us to resist the conclusion of the debunking argument. We have di we're directly acquainted with our phenomenal properties and that that's, gives us a, an assurance, a conviction of their existence, which can't be undermined by the debunking argument. So and uh, uh, this relation, this relation of, of direct acquaintance is often described as simple and primitive. What that means is we, if... if, if um, if we ask, well, how, do, what kind of relation is this? Uh, uh, what's what's involved in something in in a, in a in a in a in a person being acquainted with their phenomenal properties? What what sort of relation is it? What what um, what mechanisms are involved or whatever? The answer is uh, there's nothing really to say there. It's a primitive relation. People are just primitively acquainted with their phenomenal properties their own phenomenal properties. And there's nothing more to say. Um, there's no uh, further explanation to be given of what the relation is. Uh, now, uh, one problem for that view, I think, is, well, that doesn't sound like something that can, that this relation here, this relation of acquaintance, like phenomenal properties themselves, doesn't seem to be something that we can really fit comfortably into a naturalistic picture of the world. It's just positing primitive relations that can't be explained is, uh, is it seems a, a rather ad hoc move. You, you, um, we say, well, we're, we know about these features of the world and we, we, just, we just know about them. And it's just a, a basic, just a primitive feature of reality that subjects know about their own phenomenal properties and we can't explain it and so on. And Again, that just seems to be putting a stop to any kind of explanation there. Um, and it seems to be something that... It seems almost magical. So it, the, that's, a, I think, a problem for this view. How can it be fitted? How can we make sense of this within the sort of... Within the... Uh, uh, within a, a scientific framework? Another problem, I think, and perhaps this is an even more serious problem, is... Oh, wait, who or what exactly is supposed to be the subject of this acquaintance relation? There's, I, I, I spoke of uh, me being acquainted with my phenomenal properties, but what exactly am am I in this in this uh, account? 
uh, um, this is actually quite a, 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 a troubling question, I think, for, for phenomenal realists. And um, let me just spell that out a little bit. So here's, here's, here's the picture. We have, again, phenomenal reports and judgments fully explained by introspective process in the brain. We have phenomenal consciousness that uh, correlates with and realizes um, uh, 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 those uh, introspective uh, processes and the, the states that they that they target, and then we have a subject of some uh, a self who is acquainted with uh, their own phenomenal consciousness. And that where acquaintance here is this simple primitive relation. And what what is the subject? Who or what is the subject? Um, I'll suggest three um, possible answers here. Um, one is, well, it's, it's, it's just the brain. Somehow the brain itself is acquainted with these uh, uh, with these uh, phenomenal properties. So the brain here considered as a complex cognitive system, um, a system for processing information and generating reactions that's the hugely complex information processing and control system described by cognitive science. And somehow that system is acquainted with uh, Phenomenal con with the, with the, with its own, with the um, uh, uh, phenomena uh, with the phenomenal properties that that are that are associated with its own uh, um, uh, states. Okay, so we, we have the we have the brain doing its 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 stuff, its information processing with perception and introspection and so on. Some of those states are correlated with phenomenally conscious states, and somehow the brain is immediately acquainted with those um, those uh, phenomenally conscious states. And now the question here, I think, is, well, how could that happen? How could all that immense functional complexity interface with simple phenomenal properties? How do you how do you get that immensely complicated information processing and control system to interface in this direct, unmediated way with simple phenomenal properties. Uh, I, it, seems, it seems quite mysterious and almost magical. So how can the brain do this? How can the brain be acquainted with these simple phenomenal properties? It can't be by, it can't be by representing them. Um, I mean, the brain is a, a representational system, the way that it, the way that it, 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 it um, Responds to it to, to to the environment is by constructing representations of features of the environment and then using them uh, to control reactions. But that can't be how it interfaces with phenomenal consciousness, since representation is is not a, a simple primitive relation as acquaintance is supposed to be. Uh, representation uh, it, it involves uh, physical symbols that are sensitive to states of the world and have certain causal uh, effects on on the rest of the system. Uh, that's not a simple relation. It's a relation that uh, uh, has uh, uh, and is mediated, and it's a relation that can uh, that can go wrong, that can misfire. The, where there's rep representation, there can be misrepresentation. So this so this doesn't seem a, a very a attractive option. Again, it's the it's this recalls the um, the discussion of nomological danglers earlier. Uh, it's a it's a question about the the relation between. Uh, highly complex uh, activity and uh, physical activity in the brain and these simple uh, phenomenal properties, non-physical non phenomenal properties. Um, though here the question is how the brain could could know them, could know these properties, could, could have access to these properties. Uh, and moreover, how any access it had could have physical effects uh, if the... Uh, that phenomenal properties themselves are non-physical. Uh, again, this would seem to threaten um, uh, the, the causal uh, causal closure of the physical. Okay, so I, I don't think that option is very 
elegant or attractive. Maybe there are some ways of making it work. The philosopher Sam Coleman has, has some uh, ideas here. Um, but it certainly looks like looks a, a, a problematic picture, I think. Okay, so another option for the, uh, the, the subject is that it's uh, an immaterial soul. Um, so we're back to something like Cartesian dualism. And it has a sort of elegance to it. If phenomenal properties are simple uh, primitive properties and acquaintance is a simple primitive relation, then maybe the subject uh, that's aware of phenomenal properties of its phenomenal properties should also be a should be a simple primitive thing, a, a soul. Uh, and actually, this might be the best way of um, of underwriting this um, the, 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 this um, kind of phenomenal realism. Uh, but it is a, a very radical option, and and of course it's 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 wholly unexplanatory. It doesn't. Uh, once we brought the soul into the picture, we brought in something that's quite beyond uh, scientific explanation, and uh, uh, we can theorize about it and construct metaphysical theories of it. But really, we, we've now taken consciousness, I, I think, right out of the realm of, of science, um, and um, I, well, I for one, I'm reluctant to do that, uh, at least uh, at least at this stage. Okay, so let's look now at uh, a third option. Uh, this is somewhat similar to the first one in that the brain is the uh, subject. Uh, but the idea here is, is, is rather different. It's not that uh, the, we're not thinking of the brain as a complex cognitive system that is somehow interfacing with distinct phenomenal properties. It's that the phenomenal properties are the intrinsic nature of the brain itself, considered simply as a physical object. So the idea is that some phys physical objects have an intrinsic nature uh, that is that is that is phenomenal. It's intrinsically like something to be that physical object, um, and maybe this this phenomenal nature is the basis of all the physical characteristics of the object, all the physical uh, properties of the object. Uh, I've called this intrinsic subjectivity. So the idea is there isn't, there isn't the brain and the phenomenal properties distinct uh, from it. It's that the brain is intrinsically a phenomenal thing. So th this is a sort of view that, um, that goes along naturally with panpsychism. So the panpsychist thinks of uh, fundamental physical particles as, as having an intrinsic phenomenal nature that grounds their, uh, or th their, 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 uh, the properties described by physics. And the idea is that when you put these particles together in a complex enough way, the structure created comes to have an intrinsic phenomenal nature, uh, which is inherited or, or, or created from the, the combination of the intrinsic natures, uh, intrinsic phenomenal natures of its of its components. So on this view, you don't you don't need an uh, any interface between the, the brain and its um, uh, phenomenal properties. Uh, the acquaintance here is just a relation between an object and its own intrinsic nature. It's it's just what it is itself. Uh, now. So I, I suppose that so this is a, a possible view, but um, I don't find it a very attractive one. Uh, it's not clear to me that it does anything to justify uh, phenomenal realism. Uh, the um, without any um, interface between consciousness and the rest of cognition. Uh, phenomenal consciousness and the rest of cognition without any way in which there's there's no mechanism on this view by which phenomenal consciousness can affect any psychological processes there's no interface uh, with the representational processes in the brain and it's so the brain's own intrinsic nature and its own acquaintance with its 
uh, intrinsic nature would make no difference at all to any of uh, uh, any processes, any uh, our psychological processes, or any beliefs or reactions or other uh, any beliefs or judgments or other reactions we might have. So, so this is a metaphysical theory designed to underwrite our. Uh, conviction that phenomenal realism is true in the, in the face of the debunking argument. Um, but if that conviction itself can be fully explained in terms of introspective processes, as the debunking argument claims, then uh, it seems to me that this sort of metaphysical speculation really isn't, uh, isn't uh, justified. Now, I'm not saying that none of these options are, are possible or coherent, um, what I want to do is to point out that if you wish to hold on to phenomenal realism in the face of the debunking argument, then you're going to have to endorse uh, one of these options or, 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 or something similar. There's a cost, a heavy cost, heavy theoretical cost to maintaining phenomenal realism in the face of the debunking argument. So you're either going to have to say, that the debunking argument doesn't work, or pay some high theoretical cost to maintain your uh, phenomenal realism in the face of it. Okay, so that's the debunking argument for illusionism. Now, um, let me quickly run through a couple more arguments before we um, before we end this lecture. Okay, so let's move on now to look at uh, one more. Um, argument. Uh, this is an argument from representation. Um, and it picks up on uh, themes from the previous lecture from uh, some points um, that Dennett uh, makes. So it goes like this. Consciousness has psychological significance for us. It matters. It has effects on uh, belief, emotion, memory, on report, on what we say. If you have a conscious pain, then that, that matters to you. That um, causes all sorts of psychological reactions. But mental qualities, qualia, phenomenal properties, in themselves wouldn't have any psychological significance. Just, just by occurring, these properties wouldn't have any psychological uh, significance. Uh, things have psychological significance for us only if we notice them, if we, register, if we perceive them, register them. Um, take notice of them in some way. I mean, suppose there's a wonderfully powerful dramatic performance taking place in a theatre, but there's no audience. Then the play isn't having any uh, 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 emotional uh, impact on anyone. It isn't having any psychological significance uh, for anyone. So if there is a, a, a Quality or show in the in the in the in the in 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 the um, in the in the in the in the mind, uh, it will have no psychological effects unless there's some inner observer watching the show and reacting to it. And this, of course, is Dennett's hard question. Once sensory information has been presented to consciousness and presented as a quality or show. What happens then? What effects does the show have on the subject's psychological state? Now, the way the, the brain notices things is by representing them, uh, by forming mental representations that are sensitive to the presence of, the, of whatever feature it is that is being noticed, and then by using that representation to control reactions of various kinds. So, it's a, a, a reasonable... Um, uh, so it's reasonable to add in, in this uh, premise here. We must mentally represent a property, or our brain must mentally represent it, in order for it to have any psychological significance for us. Okay. So if there were qualia, if there were these mental qualities, then we'd have to mentally represent them in order for them to have any psychological significance for us. Let me try to spell that point out with a little thought experiment involving what I call representational zombies. 
Uh, here's a rather gruesome image, I think from Thomas Rowlandson, of uh, an operation in pre, in the days before anaesthetic. Um, and now here's the thought experiment, the intuition pump I want you to imagine. Suppose you're going to have an operation and you, you're given the choice of two different anaesthetic pills you can take. Now, the first pill, pill A, will take away all your pain qualia. There'll be no pain qualia at all. But all your pain reactions will stay the same. The pill won't affect those. So you'll have all the usual uh, physiological, psychological and behavioural reactions to what's happening. So the physiological reactions, all the, uh, the effects on your hormones or stress levels and so on, and sweating and, you know, and the tensing up and everything, all the psychological reactions, you, you will believe that something terrible is happen, happening to you, you will desperately want it to stop, you'll have all the emotional um, reactions associated with, with, with this kind of trauma, uh, you'll have all the normal, all the usual behavioural reactions to, 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 to pain, you'll be screaming, you'll be crying out, you'll be struggling, you'll be um, distressed like this gentleman here. So you will react in every, it, 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 physiologically, psychologically and behaviourally just as if you were in terrible pain. But the pain qualia will be gone. Now the, the other pill, pill B, will do the opposite. It will quell all your pain reactions. You won't have any of the normal reactions to uh, this kind of trauma. Uh, you won't have any of the physiological reactions, you won't be sweating and stressed up and, 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 and tense and so on, you won't uh, have any of the psychological reactions associated with pain, you won't believe that something bad is happening, you won't want what's happening to stop, you won't uh, uh, have uh, reactions of emotional, re the normal emotional reactions to um, uh, 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 pain, you won't have any memories when, uh, of, 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 of anything bad happening to you, None of those. You won't have any behavioural reactions either. You will just sit perfectly calm. You won't be crying out. You won't be saying this is dreadful. You, um, none of that. You will just be sitting there quite calmly. Um, you won't be having any bad thoughts. You won't uh, be showing any signs at all of distress. However, all your pain qualia will be left intact. And the way this pill does it is by preventing you forming any mental representations of your qualia. So, uh, the show is being presented in the Cartesian Theatre, let us assume, but there's no one watching. Um, there's n there are no, uh, there is, the, the, the brain is not noticing the show that's happening there. In terms of Dennett's hard question, and what happens then? Nothing happens then in this case. It's just a pure show which is having no effects on anything. In the case of pill A, on the other hand, there isn't a show, but all the reactions that the show would have caused are happening. So the representations of qualia are still being produced here and having all the normal effects. They're misrepresentations because there isn't a qualia show but they're having all the normal effects that the qualia show would have had. So we can say that pill A turns you into a zombie, a standard philosophical zombie who uh, is a physical duplicate of ours and reacts um, exactly like, has all the same uh, psychological states as ours and reacts exactly like ours, but doesn't have the qualia. And pill B turns, turns you into what I call a representational zombie, a creature that does have the qualia but doesn't have any representations of them and accordingly doesn't have any of the reactions that they we should expect them to cause. Now, which pill would you take? Um, undoubtedly, the surgeon would prefer you to take pill B because you'll be a much more uh, tractable patient, uh, um, because you'll be a much more uh, much calmer and uh, um, more uh, tractable subject for him to work on. What about you? Uh, if you think that qualia matter in themselves, apart from any uh, psychological effects they have, then I guess you should take pill A. Um, but if, you're, if you think that it's the effects that matter, then you should go for pill B. Um, and 
the intuition that I'm trying to pump here is that pill B would be the better one. Uh, and, and that would tend to support the idea, the, the, the claim I uh, made uh, earlier, that we must mentally represent a property in order for it to have any psychological significance. Because in general, things we don't notice don't matter to us psychologically. Qualia we didn't notice wouldn't matter to us psychologically. And now, here, here's the, the, the crucial move. If it's the representations that are doing the real work in making pain matter, why does it matter whether they're correct representations? Non-veridical representations of qualia, of pain qualia, would have all the same psychological effects as veridical ones. It doesn't matter whether there's a show there. What matters is that there are representations of a show there. Okay. So the illusion of qualia would have just the same effects as real qualia would. And we've no introspective way of checking whether our representations are veridical, are truthful or not. You know you have these uh, these reactions, you know you're in these psychological states which are simply being produced by uh, representational processes of some kind, but you don't know whether the representations that are generating these reactions are veridical or not. All you know is that they're representing uh, and in a world of awfulness. And, of course, external checks, from a third-person point of view, suggest that they're, they're not um, truthful, they're not veridical. Scientists find no evidence of qualia in your, in your brain. So, the moral of that is that, given the anomalousness of phenomenal properties, and how difficult it is to find a place for them within our scientific picture of the world, given that we don't need to posit them in order to explain all our, all our um, reactions, our psychological reactions, our judgments and our reports and so on, and given that we've no introspective way of telling whether or not they are real, uh, the not the obvious inference is that a sense that we have an inner world of phenomenal consciousness is a, a misrepresentation generated by our introspective processes. One more quick consideration. Uh, authority. This is a claim that's commonly made about phenomenal properties, that we are authoritative about them. If you judge that you're having a certain an experience with a certain phenomenal property, then you are having one. There's no room for you to be mistaken about your own qualia. Now, this is often taken to be uh, an objection to illusionism because the illusionist says, well, you know, we, we, um, uh, we're wrong about our own qualia. We're wrong to think we're even we're having them at all. Um, and it's it's often replied that there's no room for that kind of error when it comes to qualia. If you judge that you're having a, uh, that, that you're experiencing uh, uh, phenomenal pain, then you are experiencing phenomenal pain. So that's that's usually taken as a as a, as a problem for uh, illusionism. Illusionism, but actually, I think it's it it it. it, it, it from a certain perspective, it offers support for illusionism in this way. Suppose the realist were right and phenomenal properties are real things that exist independently of our judgments. Okay, so there, there are these real phenomenal properties and then we are somehow aware of them and we make judgments about them. Okay, well then surely there would be the possibility of our judgments being wrong. I mean, we're not infallible, right? We're, we make misjudgments all the time. If these properties are genuinely independent of our judgments, then why should we be so why should we be authoritative about them in that way? If someone's trying to write a report of something they've witnessed, of a of a, a crime or an accident, say, they can make mistakes. Their judgments aren't guaranteed to be right. Similarly, if someone's trying to give a report on their own qualia, why couldn't they be? 
Oh, why couldn't they be mistaken? If the quiet, they're quietly are, 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 are things that exist independently of those judgments. So, looked at in that way, uh, the claim that we're authoritative about our phenomenal properties actually seems to present a problem for realism, for the idea that these things exist independently of our judgments. What if instead they were more like constructions, theoretical constructions out of our judgments? So that we say that our experience has a certain quality when we judge that it has, when we're disposed to judge that it has. Uh, so they're more like a fiction. The story that's the, the the narrative that's being produced is not a description of some independently existing reality, but more like a fiction created by an by a novelist. I have the picture here of uh, Arthur Conan Doyle, who wrote the Sherlock Holmes stories. In such a case, the author does have this kind of authority. So if Conan Doyle writes that Sherlock Holmes was wearing a deer snorter hat and smoking a meerschaum pipe, then that's what Sherlock Holmes was doing. Um, because Sherlock Holmes is simply a construction, a, a, a fictional construction out of the narrative that Sherlock Holmes, that uh, Conan Doyle created. Um, there's nothing more to Sherlock Holmes having a certain property than Conan Doyle specifying that he had it, because he's the author. And, it, and maybe our reports about our inner lives are also a kind of story, a kind of fiction that we're telling. Uh, and qualia and what it is likenesses and so on are characters in this story, in this fiction. Now, if that was so, and so for it to be the case that I have a certain, uh, that, that I'm, I, I'm acquainted with a certain quality, it, it's enough that I sincerely report that I am, that I include it in my narrative, in my story. That explains the authority. It's like the authority that an author has over his fictions. Now, it's important to stress that in likening these uh, phenomenal reports to fictions, I'm not suggesting that they're deliberate fictions, things that we just make up at will, um, like, uh, uh, like a, a novelist um, uh, does. No, these, are produced, these reports are produced by introspective mechanisms that are tracking uh, uh, real um, uh, internal processes, processes in our brains, representational uh, 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 perceptual processes and the reactions that these perceptual processes uh, generate. It's just that we cast these reports, we, we find it natural to cast these reports in terms of a private inner world of mental qualities, a world of um, qualia, phenomenal properties, phenomenal consciousness. And to that extent, these uh, reports are fictional. They're cast in a fictional language. And qualia are characters in this theoretical fiction that we, that we create. So, on that way of looking at it, authority, our authority about our uh, phenomenal states is actually a reason for preferring illusionism to realism because it explains the nature of our authority about our own qualia. Um, as I put it there, if all there is to having a certain phenomenal property is judging that you have it, sincerely reporting to yourself or to others that you have it, then you're authoritative about your phenomenal properties. Just as if all there is to Sherlock Holmes wearing a deerstalker hat is Conan Doyle saying that he does, then Conan Doyle is authoritative about whether or not Sherlock Holmes is wearing a deerstalker hat. So, um, so then this is just to say that phenomenal properties are merely intentional objects, that they exist only as the objects of our beliefs and judgments and uh, reports, just as illusionism claims. Exactly as Sherlock Holmes exists, only as a, uh, the object of the, the thoughts we entertain while reading... Uh, Conan Doyle's novels. Okay, so we're coming to the end now, and uh, 
One final consideration, progressiveness. There's an awful lot of work being done on consciousness from a variety of perspectives, metaphysical perspectives, scientific perspectives, and so on. Uh, one of the problems, I think, for a lot of this work is that it isn't progressive in the sense that it doesn't uh, produce a research, that it doesn't generate research programs that are going to be uh, productive, that are going to yield uh, testable hypotheses. In this area, I think illusionism scores much better. It supports a progressive research program. First of all, it offers a clear explanatory target. Um, the heterophenomenology, or our reports about our, um, uh, about our, uh, our, our reports about our, our own experience and other reactions that we make in response to our own experience. Uh, all the all the responses we give to probes uh, of our own experience of our experience, and that contrasts, um, I think, with realist theories in general, for the simple reason that the notion of qualia itself, the notion of phenomenal properties, is poorly defined. This is the um, the coherence argument from the beginning, uh, from Dennett, which um, picks up on everything that we uh, talked about in the previous lecture. It's not clear that the no at all that the notion of qualia offers a clear explanatory target. Uh, second, uh, illusionism offers in, encourages the development of testable hypotheses. Uh, we're trying to explain how people will respond to probes about their own uh, probes of their experience, asking them to uh, indicate in some way what their experience is like. If we develop when we develop if we develop theories about how phenomenal reports and uh, uh, about how phenomenal reports are produced and how other reactions to uh, experience probes are produced, then we can test those by predicting what responses people will give to probes in particular situations. In particular, we can devise experiments where we present them with uh, unusual stimuli, stimuli that they've, they've not encountered before, so unusual visual stimuli perhaps, or uh, unusual uh, combinations of sounds or smells or whatever, and we'll be able to predict what they will, how they will respond to probes, how they will respond, say, if we ask them what it was like. We can test that and see if they do respond in that way. And uh, this contrasts with many realist theories, many of which make no predictions at all about how people will behave. Our panpsychist theories, for example, uh, make no empirical predictions at all. It's mere, they're merely an, a metaphysical theory uh, that finds a place for consciousness in our picture of the world without supposing that it actually makes any uh, difference to how people behave. It may be involved at a deep level in causing their behavior, but it doesn't make any difference. They would still behave in that way if uh, the fundamental realizing properties were, were not phenomenal, but were something else. So that's one way in which illusionism uh, is more pr uh, progressive. Uh, also, um, it invites multidisciplinary work. It's not just a matter of philosophical theorizing, metaphysical theorizing. It involves bringing together all the um, uh, people right across the cognitive sciences and neuroscience and uh, psychology and um, even AI and areas like such as that. It also invites evolutionary theorizing. How did this, uh, uh, according to the illusionist, our uh, sense that we are phenomenally conscious is uh, the product of introspective mechanisms of some kind. So we can ask how and why those mechanisms in, evolved. Uh, and this opens up interesting new possibilities that I think wouldn't, wouldn't, be, wouldn't even present themselves on, on other theories. Um, for instance, it, it opens this possibility that the sense of being phenomenally conscious, the sense of being phenomenally conscious, not actually being phenomenally conscious, but having the sense that you're phenomenally conscious, might be adaptive even if phenomenal consciousness itself wouldn't be, even if phenomenal consciousness w would be epiphenomenal and make no difference, maybe the sense of being phenomenally conscious would make a difference. Maybe it's ac actually adaptive to have this sense of having a, uh, a magical inner world, 
a world that's not really physical, that's not really part of the physical world and that makes us metaphysically special in some way. Maybe that actually is is is, uh, is in some way a benefit to us. Maybe it, it enhances our our our. Uh, our, our lives that maybe it makes our lives richer and more uh, fulfilling in some way that that contributes to our to our fitness and indeed this this view has been argued for by the psychologist uh, Nicholas Humphrey in his 2011 book Soul Dust a, a book that I would uh, that I recommend strongly so I think there are so I think there are lots of positive aspects progressive aspects to the illusionist program that I think uh, are, are, are not uh, features of of uh, realist um, theories and what this leaves us with uh, the with an, uh, an illusionist program that is, is certainly challenging it's not going to be a, an easy task to 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 explain consciousness even from an illusionist perspective but it's not going to be an impossibly hard task we're not we're, the, the the problem with realist theories of consciousness is not simply that they have a they're trying to address a hard problem but they're trying to address one that is uh, from the point of view of third-person science, at least impossible, that can only be dealt with really by philosophical theorizing, it doesn't lend itself to this sort of progressive, multidisciplinary uh, empirical research program. And it, again, I think that's another reason for uh, preferring uh, illusionism. So there, there are a bunch of uh, considerations in support of illusionism. I don't think any of them is a, is a knockdown one, but put them all together, I think there's quite a strong case there for at least for taking illusionism seriously and perhaps for treating it as Daniel Dennett uh, says, as the default theory of consciousness. Not the only one, it's not the, the only possible op option, but maybe it's the one we should try first and see how far we can get with that before we move uh, to, um, uh, to realist theories and with all the um, uh, problems they bring with them. Okay, so that's the end of this lecture. Next time we're going to look at some objections and replies. The, uh, on first hearing about illusionism, many people's reaction is simply that you cannot be serious, as some tennis players are inclined to say to the to the line judge. It's uh, incomprehension and and outrage is a common response, and and this attitude is backed up with a number of objections, many of which are felt to be very powerful. So next time I will look at some of these objections and reply to them and try to convince you that these objections are not as uh, powerful as you might think and that we really can be serious about illusionism. Okay, so thank you very much for listening and I'll see you next time.